शिवे सर्वार्थ साधिके शरण्ये त्र्यंबके गौरी नारायणी नमो जेखाने मायर नाम शेखाने आनंद धाम आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम जेखाने मायर नाम शेखाने आनंद धाम आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम जेखाने मायर गीति शेखाने नाही को भीति आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम 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 जेकाने मायेर को था शेखाने नाही को बेता आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम जेकाने मायेर भाम शेखाने ओम्रितो लाभ आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम 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 जेकाने मात्रिलोक शेखाने नाही को शोक आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम जेकाने मायर बोध शेखाने नाही को क्रोध आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम 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 जेकाने मायर गान शेकाने जुड़ाओ प्राण आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम जेकाने माँ के पावा घुचा भी शौकोल चावा आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम 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 शेखाने मानाम सुधा शेखाने नाही तो खुदा आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम शेखाने मा उपाशोना शेखाने गंगा जमुना आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम 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 जेकाने मायर नाम शेखाने बॉय कुंठो दाम आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम जपोरे मायर नाम भजोरे मायर नाम आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम आनंद 
आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम जेकाने मायेर नाम शेकाने राम कृष्ण धाम आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम जेकाने मायेर नाम शेकाने राम कृष्ण धाम आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम जेकाने शारुदा रूपा माबीराजे ओपोरूपा आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम जेकाने शारुदा रूपा माबीराजे ओपोरूपा आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम आनंदम शुद्धु आनंदम
ಸ್ಥಾಪಕಾಯ ಚ ಧರ್ಮ ಸರ್ವಧರ್ಮಸ್ವಿಣೆ ಅವತಾರ ವರಿಷ್ಠಾಯ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣಾಯ ನಮಃ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಟು ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ದ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಲೈಫ್ ಆಫ್ ಡೈರೆಕ್ಟ್ ಡಿಸೈಪಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಶ್ರೀ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣಾನಂದ ಜಿ ಮಹಾರಾಜ್ ಪೋಸ್ ಕಾಲ್ಡ್ ಶಶಿಭೂಷಣ ಚಕ್ರವರ್ತಿ ಇನ್ ಇಸ್ ಪ್ರೀ ಮೊನಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ಲೈಫ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಆಲ್ರೆಡಿ ಕಂಪ್ಲೀಟೆಡ್ ದ ಲೈಫ್ ಆಫ್ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣಾನಂದ ಜಿ ಮಹಾರಾಜ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಟೀಕನ್ is complete works now i am finding some more materials from the teachings of swami ramakrishna anand ji maharaj and i am getting here and there some incidences from his life so i will be also including that as i get them i will go on including in our discussion now we shall see some of the sayings of swami ramakrishna anand ji maharaj on his guru or ishta devata shri ramakrishna mentioning about the personality of shri ramakrishna shashi bhushana chakravarti or shashi maharaj swami ramakrishna anand ji is telling everything about shri ramakrishna is super human everything about shri ramakrishna is superhuman ramakrishna anand ji is telling i heard from shri ramakrishna's own lips what is that the key to this room has to be turned the reverse way the key to this room has to be turned the reverse way now quoting this wonderful teaching of shri ramakrishna the key to this room <coughs> has to be turned the reverse way that is the room to spirituality ramakrishna anand ji is explaining this means that if anybody wants to attain divine knowledge or wisdom worldly means will be of no avail <coughs> that is the meaning of the statement of shri ramakrishna the key to this room has to be turned the reverse way if anybody wants to attain divine knowledge worldly means will be of no avail continuing his explanation on shri ramakrishna statement the key to this room has to be turned the reverse way shishi maharaj is telling shri krishna also taught the same thing and he is quoting that bhagavad gita statement in that which is night to all beings in that which is night to all beings the man of self control he is awake and where all beings are awake there is night for the sage who sees now let us go and understand this statement of shri ramakrishna the key to this room that is the room to spirituality or the religious life has to be turned the reverse way and shishi maharaj explaining that giving the example of bhagavad gita what is that verse of the bhagavad gita it is in the second chapter 69th verse and what is that verse yanisha sarvabhutanam tasyam 
जागर्ति संयमी यस्याम जागृति भूता सा निशा पश्य तो मुने From the second chapter, 69th verse, you may ask me what is this? You are not told the meaning, and you are telling what a wonderful verse. Yanisha, sarva bhuta nam tasyam jagrati sanyami sanyam jagrati bhuta ni sanisha pashyato mune. The moment we utter these verses, since we know little of Sanskrit, so we can understand the meaning and enjoy it. I'm connecting that here. What is the meaning of the 69th verse of the second chapter in the Bhagavad Gita? Lord Krishna is telling, "Shri Bhagavan Vacha, the Lord Himself is telling the Avatar Purusha Shri Krishna that which is night to all beings, that which is night to all the living beings, therein the self-controlled one, the self-controlled yogi keeps awake." that is in which beings are awake that in which all the living beings are awake is night that is the awakened yogi the realized yogi self controlled yogi that is night means he will be sleeping there to the sage who sees who really sees so now isn't it this uh, statement of krishna a little peculiar it is something like a staggering statement what is night to all beings is day to the self realized sage what is day to them is night to him such seemingly inconsistent statements appear in other parts of bhagavad gita too they help to heighten the listener's attention see because of this seemingly inconsistent or staggering statement you started scratching your brain you want to understand what is this that is the reason why krishna has given such inconsistent seemingly inconsistent statement so that it helps to heighten the listener's attention particularly to emphasize an important subject now let us go into this and understand then you will come back again to the teaching of shri ramakrishna the experience of the ignorant men of the world the experience of the ignorant men of the world we are all ignorant men and women children so our experiences the experience of the ignorant men and women of world and a man of enlightenment or a woman of enlightenment are as widely divergent as night and day the experiences of these two people the realized person and the worldly ignorant people the experiences of this world are divergent widely divergent as night and day a self realized sage ever awakened to the supreme consciousness that is his true nature that is present within him he is that so he is ever awakened the self realized sage ever awakened to the supreme consciousness lives a life of infinite knowledge and bliss so his experience of this world is widely divergent so he lives the life of infinite knowledge and bliss but on the contrary the beings the ordinary ignorant beings of the world know nothing of such a life instead the ignorant being all the people all the people men women old young everybody all of us instead we are attached and involved in this world just like you see we are conducting many wonderful programs we have brought in such a wonderful speaker who is talking about thought 
we are talking about wisdom it's talking about wellness but only few people the awakened people had come to hear but the ignorant people they want to enjoy kruger's park they want to enjoy mountain resorts so they want worldly enjoyment while the wellness and health is being discussed only few people attended because the other people are more interested in worldly joys they run away the even when with so much difficulty the ashram is arranging many of our own people they are sleepy they can't get up come out of the cozy atmosphere of the blanket so cold outside nicely sleep saturday sunday we have got holiday why to waste that opportunity what will you get there some things of the neurons and brains and thoughts and other things such a wonderful program it was such i enjoyed the talk on the thought how we can change our life by changing our attitude i myself sitting there i enjoyed every bit of it and our own people and many other people even though knowing well they run for worldly enjoyments instead of wellness when the monkey when they throw the banana and money in front of it what will the monkey choose it will choose only banana it will give up the money because it doesn't know with money you can buy many many bananas so likewise if you throw monkey no the monkey is over now we human beings who are like monkeys you throw some bananas then you throw some money and health we choose only banana and money not health why we do not know but by wellness by health we can get more wealth we can be more healthy and earn more wealth and also bananas so we are not uh, more than any those monkeys with our attitude we want only worldly enjoyment so here you can see the beings the ordinary beings the ignorant beings of the world know nothing of such a life of infinite knowledge and bliss they don't want knowledge at all they want only food for the stomach they don't want food for the thought they don't want food for the mind they don't want food for the emotions they don't want food for the spirit the soul they want only food for the stomach physical food enjoy only for the indriyas food for the senses enjoyment going here and there that's all and also they teach the same to their children and what will they learn when they grow up and when something happens they don't come to their control they run here and there behind lust drugs and many other things then they will come to the people and ask what happened we did that to the god we did so much of work to the god and what happened to our children you are not trained them you are not given food for the mind for the emotions for the thoughts and when everything the life goes every we then start crying blaming god and blaming everything so there is a saying in english we give it's an indian saying but i'm translating it to english we give the service of the lord to the missionaries how aarti is done by missions the drums during the aarti and other things are beaten by the machines the coconut is broken by the machines now so now decoration is done by the machines the light is lighted everything is mission you are given every service of the lord to the missionaries but when the lord inspired by you gives your service to the missionaries like the ventilator the oxygen rate oxygen rate oxygenator the icu machineries which will be bleeping in the icu and when the lord says i see you in the icu 
then we start crying oh what happened we give up everything all the things of service of the lord to the missionaries and inspired by that when the lord gives our care to the missionaries then we start crying so instead the worldly people are attached and involved in the world they want this petty joys of the world they are caught up in the web of perceptions and actions of the body feelings and emotions of the mind and thoughts and ideas of the intellect this involvement fetters their lives with limitations and restrictions they suffer from mental agitation and sorrow such a life is dark to the liberated soul such a life of worldly enjoyment is dark to the liberated soul to the person who has controlled his senses who wants the higher joys people even they might have not realized or completely controlled the senses at least they are wanting to get that knowledge they are better than these worldly people who are just running here and there after all the difficulties they get in life still they don't come to god they run here and there and get so much of problems so they are this involvement fetters their lives with limitations and restrictions they suffer from mental agitation and sorrow such a life is dark to the liberated soul enjoying supreme peace and bliss he does not know the bondage of worldly involvement thus the experiences of his age and other beings are diametrically opposite to each other two different world as it were one of an infinite changeless imperishable nature the other of a finite changing and perishable nature that's why you can see the words of krishna you can see how the worldly people are in darkness there the realized soul the man of god is awake and wherever these worldly people are awake this man of realized soul is sleeping there that is it seems very funny staggering statement but see it is only to wake us up but are we going to get up by these statements of lord krishna and ramakrishna and these great people not at all we want to sleep we want to enjoy our laziness never mind that's why the statement of shri ramakrishna the key to this room the key to religion the key to religious life spiritual life the key to this room has to be turned the reverse way this means that if ramakrishna and the ji is telling now if anybody wants to attain knowledge worldly means will be of no avail shri krishna also taught the same thing in that which is night to all beings the man of self control is awake and where all beings are awake there is night for the sage who sees shri ramakrishna's pure life is a glowing example of this teaching ramakrishna ananda ji shri maharaj is comparing the life of shri ramakrishna to the teachings now lord krishna he gave the teachings in the bhagavad gita in the dwapara yuga now the same lord krishna has taken the body as ramakrishna and leading that life the same teaching is being led by now so shri ramakrishna's pure life is glowing example of this teaching of the bhagavad gita yanisha sarva bhutanam tasyam jagrat sayami his life is beyond ordinary human understanding shri ramakrishna's life is beyond ordinary human understanding for what people regard as good was bad in his eyes and what people regard as giving them happiness and peace he knew to be the cause of all misery and we are going behind that misery just like ramakrishna used to give the example of 
the crow there will be some berries it's called lantana a plant called lantana in india the other countries too it may be there so that lantana is used for hedging or fencing so that the animals and other beings cannot come into the ground or the flower garden or the vegetable garden and eat off those things the cows the sheep the goat and other things cannot come so they and also it will be beautiful it will give out beautiful flowers so it gives out berries so those berries when when it is ripened it will be sweet but if you eat more you will get colic stomach ache so ramakrishna gives the example of the crow will come eat that fruit and then because it is sweet afterwards it will get colic then it will curse the fruits and tell i will never again eat it it causes me colic next time when the stomach ache is gone and sees that sweet fruit that berry small berry the crow again get tempted it goes and start eating and again after some time it will get colic stomach ache and again it will curse the fruits and tells i will never again go and eat it then again the next the same day the same with us so we know it is pain we do that which is painless and it will remove all the rem- miseries getting the spiritual knowledge the higher intellectual knowledge we know that but we don't want to get it but we know this causes this all these worldly things causes misery but we don't want to have it just like ravana sorry not ravana it is uh, duryodhana he told krishna when krishna asked him why are you doing all these things give pandavas their due their share of the property the kingdom at least give them five villages the war can be averted many people will die many children will lose their parents many wives will lose their husbands and they will become widows stop this atrocity please give <clears throat> not the half the kingdom what is due for the pandavas just give five villages i ask them to be just happy with that then duryodhana told i will not give them land worth the top of five needles war if they want to get it by war whatever krishna tried to avert the war then why are you doing like this what was his reply janami dharmyam i know what is righteousness nachame pravrittihi i don't want to practice it janam yadharmyam i know what is adharma unrighteousness nachame nivrittihi i don't want to give it up that was the statement of duryodhana to lord krishna himself the lord is sitting in front of him and asking him begging him to stop war do the right thing telling i know what is righteousness but i don't want to perform it nachame pravrutti hi i don't i am not interested in that janam adharmyam i know what is unrighteousness then nachame pravrutti hi sorry nachame nivrutti hi i don't want to give i am performing all unrighteousness i don't want to give it up we all know that this worldly enjoyment sensory things will give us pain in the long run but we don't want to give it up we want to enjoy them many things good things have been arranged by the ashrama for our welfare and the name itself is health well being wellness nachame pravritti hi we are not interested in that and these things running here and there to other places enjoying nachame nivrutti hi we know that we will be robbed we will be hijacked but still we want to run there here yeah, you will get peace of mind so many good things not interested so for what people regard as good was bad in the eyes of shri ramakrishna and what people regard as giving them happiness and peace shri ramakrishna knew to be the cause of all misery and restlessness now shishi maharaj is continuing shri ramakrishna's divine power was unparalleled and irresistible 
In order to explain this phenomenon, it is necessary to cite a few instances from his life. Ramakrishna Nambuji is continuing. Wherever there is a play of great power, there God manifests. Wherever there is a play of great power, there God manifests. Now, one may ask, what greatness can be found in the temple priest called Ramakrishna? Well, the temple priest, ordinary temple priest, who draws a monthly salary of only seven rupees, that would make people revere him as a manifestation of God, that to avatara. From a human viewpoint, it seems to be impossible. A few years ago, Sri Ramakrishna's greatness was not known to the world at large. Ramakrishna Nandaji is speaking this 160 years back or 150 years back. What is he telling? A few years ago, Sri Ramakrishna's greatness was not known to the world at large. But today, that is now when Ramakrishna Nandaji is telling this. Maybe it is 1902 or 1905 or 1890. So when Ramakrishna Ji is uttering, but today there is no nation that has been heard, that has not heard of him, heard of Ramakrishna and does not regard him with great reverence. What is the reason? Ramakrishna had poverty. Ramakrishna had lack of modern education, what we call so-called education. So his poverty and lack of modern education are two factors that highlight his greatness. A desired object is attained by a certain means and practice of that means brings perfection. It does not require proof, therefore, to understand that he who can attain a desired object without any visible means or effort on his part possesses great powers. So we think modern day education, if you go to the school, colleges, get some degree, master degree or PhD or postdoctorate, then only that is real education. But Ramakrishna, at that time, when he was born, it was 1836, and there was no English education in India. That was the year, that very year, 1836, that Macaulay, from British, he introduced English education, the Western education, so that's what we call the so-called the present education. So Ramakrishna didn't have it. So is that does that mean that he was not great. What is true education? Simply collection of some information and just sitting on the in front of the typewriter or the keyboard of the computer and handling the computer and mobile is education. You get so much of information of different wonderful knowledge and you never put that into use. You study law and you'll be sitting in the computer and you never practice law at all. You'll be studying such so many things of science and you know, pra never practice it, you will be transcribing from some multinational company. Somewhere in the dead of the night, you will be tra transcribing it. Medical transcription or some other transcription to some other country for the sake of money. What is the use of all the knowledge you have learned? You never put that into practice. So money earning is the only goal of your education. Is that education? Is that greatness? So here Ramakrishna never had that. He had poverty, but... He got real education. What is that? Swami Vivekananda tells, education is the manifestation of perfection which is already within man. His education, collection of information, the collection of information would have been education. Then libraries would have been better professors. So these are the statement of Swami Vivekananda. And in the modern day, the hard disks, the hard drives, with so much of gigabytes, megabytes, terabytes of knowledge, information, they would have be become better professors. But only a human being can become a professor. 
the library, the hard disk cannot become a professor. So education is something different. It is not collection of information. Swami Vivekananda tells if I am given another opportunity to get educated, I will not go in for collection of facts, but rather I will go for focusing or concentrating the mind. The concentrated mind will act like a torchlight or a laser light. Put that mind anywhere and the nature will reveal, reveal that knowledge to you. And that is what Ramakrishna did. He sat and meditated and concentrated his mind. Then wherever he put it, he collected knowledge at the tip of his fingers. So many he, had, he did that he got that photographic memory, the concentration of the mind. Afterwards, so many rishis, money, great people came. He collected information from them at will. What was the thing first he did? What is that beautiful statement in one of the Upanishad? Asminu bhagavo vignatum sarva vignam sarva midam vignatum bhavati. One of the disciple is going to the guru and asking, I want to get that knowledge. I want to know that thing by knowing which everything is known. We are taking tidbits here and there and trying to learn. And we have a whole life is not enough. You may take hundreds of life. You cannot learn the knowledge of information of this whole world. Even the great scientists have not completed learning for if science and education has started some 200 years back, the research after 200 years, even now, after so much of modern research and everything, not even 10% or 1% of the universe is known by the scientists. But our Rishis and Munis wanted to know what is the question asked by that great disciple to his guru. Kasminu bhagavo vignatu. Kasminu. By knowing which, by knowing one, I want to know that one, by knowing which, I will know everything of this world. And what is that? God. You may call it God. Others may call it something. Knowledge, wisdom, consciousness, pure consciousness, Atman, Paramatman, whatever. The Lord has created this world, this whole universe. If you realize him, if you come to know him, who is within you, then will he not reveal everything of this world? So I want to know that by knowing which I will know everything. I don't want all these simple, little, little things. The millions of life is not enough for me to collect information. But I want to know that by knowing which I will know everything. That is what Ramakrishna did. He showed what is true education. Your master degree, your degree, your 180 degree, 360 degree was not important for him. What was important for Sri Ramakrishna? I want to know that by knowing which I will know everything. He went for that highest God realization. Highest realization of the truth. And then that divinity took the form of the divine mother, Durga, and gave whatever he want, she gave at will. She brought everything to him at one place in Dakshineshwar. Every people came to him to give him knowledge. The divine mother made him. Prakriti, Parama Prakriti, the whole nature, who is the empress of this world, she gave education to him. It was revealed. Everything, everything was revealed to him. So that is true education. The manifestation of perfection, which is already within man. What is religion? The manifestation of divinity, which is already within man. If A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. What is education? Perfection. What is perfection? Divinity. The manifestation of divinity, that is the Lord, the divinity which is within you, the pure consciousness, that is true education. Ramakrishna got the real education. We are just staggering to get that. You are not even got a minuscule of that. A desired object, Ramakrishna Nandaji is telling, attained by a certain means and practice of that means brings perfection. It does not require proof. Therefore, to understand that he who can attain a desired object without any visible means or efforts on his part possesses great powers. 
one will have to admit unequivocally that divine power is manifested in a person who single handedly and without any arm and ammunition defeats a well equipped army nowadays if people want to be scholars they study many many books bookish knowledge the greater the number of books one has read the more learned he is supposed to be but shri ramakrishna did not study books at all sometimes he would say grantha granthi grantha means book granthi means not so ramakrishna is to tell, tell grantho granthi that is books the bookish knowledge or knots you are having more confusion mere book learning usually increases a person's ego binding him to the world you are getting all the unbaked knowledge of that person who has written that book when shri ramakrishna was young as a small child of maybe 7 or 8 he met a pandit a scholar of the vedanta philosophy who taught him about the impermanence of the world jagat mithya brahma satya he taught about the impermanence of the world and the reality of god from their talk now shri ramakrishna is a small child of 7 or 8 he thought from this teaching this pandit this scholar was free from all worldly enjoyments from all worldly attachments one day however he saw that scholar or pandit performing rituals as a priest for a little rice and coin and some slippers you know now the priest will perform the death ceremony or the birth ceremony or some other puja then they will demand you have to give them slippers umbrella money if they don't give they will get angry they have so much of knowledge but they are bothered about only umbrella slippers money gifts they are not bothered about the higher thing at all so that's why ramakrishna tells it is not only of the priest all of us are like that that is only the example given here so one day however he saw that pandit the scholar performing rituals as a priest for a little rice and what are we doing we are also doing the same thing for we have read so much of science knowledge arts and other things realizing that those things greatness of that in our life searching for the truth what are we doing we are day and night going to earn money and money and money and money and money nothing else than that we are selling all our knowledge for money what is that like this convinced shri ramakrishna as a child of 7 or 8 that me see in that young age itself ramakrishna was convinced what did he get convinced what was his conviction this convinced shri ramakrishna as a small child that mere book learning does not help a person attain true knowledge and that there must be some other means to attain it thus he became disgusted with this type of bookish learning later seeing the scholars pandits talk about the transcendental truths of the vedanta but in their activity they were only bothered about worldly attachment and worldly desires and making money so later seeing such pandits or scholars talking about the transcendental truths of vedanta but their mind was only on the worldly enjoyments he often compared them to the vultures how as vultures soar very high though their eyes are always on the charnel pits where the bodies are rotting they may soar very high <clears throat> very high but where is their sight upon is there any dead body rotting body i want to eat that is the aim of the vultures though they soar may soar very high we may have so much of education so much of knowledge but what do we use that only for earning money and we don't utilize that knowledge in our life and make our life a divine life but rather we gone for worldly enjoyments so 
just like the vultures they soar very high but where is their sight on the charnel pits or if there is any body rotting to eat as vultures so very high though their eyes are always on the charnel pits so the pandits the scholars constantly talk about high spiritual matters but their minds are on only money once one of his disciple ramakrishna's disciple was studying the literature of the parsis persian language neglecting his service to the master sri ramakrishna told him my boy this book learning will make you your mind more restless it may even destroy your love for god this scolding brought the disciple to his senses that was none other than ramakrishna himself ramakrishna nanda ji shashi bhushan chakravarti that was he was learning that persian language now shashi maharaj is telling by reading too many books the mind becomes filled with other people confused thoughts and loses the capacity of thinking for itself you don't become original thinkers copycats if book learning stimulates one's thinking it is good if book learning stimulates one's thinking it's good but if it destroys one's cap- capability to think then it is to be avoided sri ramakrishna shunned such book learning and sought spiritual knowledge in his own pure mind within a short time he acquired so much knowledge that from his inexhaustible supply he freely distributed it to the people the rich the poor the learned and the ignorant all felt themselves blessed by listening to his holy words now ramakrishna nanda ji is continuing we had read in the upanishad that there are two types of knowledge what are they the higher and the lower para apara the lower knowledge is considered to be the study of the scriptures or the book the science the arts and other things they are the lower knowledge while the higher knowledge is that through which one realizes truth you may call it god you may call it atman paramatman consciousness whatever we could not understand this truth until we came in contact with shri ramakrishna sai shishi maharaj with the help of this higher knowledge the knowledge of truth the knowledge of brahman the master could dispel the ignorance of both the pandits and the illiterate nowhere else has such a phenomenon been seen this proves that he was god incarnate avatar this itself proves now shishi maharaj is continuing nowadays it is almost impossible for a person to be respected without wealth you know without money without the show off without a good vehicle house you are not respected nowadays shishi maharaj is telling it is almost impossible for a person to be respected without wealth wealth makes even a fool appear learned wealth makes even a fool appear learned and the impossible possible so nowadays wealth is worshiped everywhere yesterday was yesterday no fifth was lakshmi vrata oh, so much of this thing we do puja why we want money wealth but saraswati puja we don't take so much of interest why knowledge but if saraswati comes if knowledge comes wisdom comes automatically lakshmi has to follow lakshmi will come there but we are interested only in worship of lakshmi not saraswati so nowadays wealth is worshiped everywhere but shri ramakrishna realized that attachment for wealth binds the soul and it is the root cause of all evil he had such great repulsion for golden coins or any metallic coins that he could not even touch a metallic object if his hand touched any such object it would become numb it is because of this complete renunciation of money and wealthy people and wealth the wealthy people regarded themselves as blessed 
when they could serve him and spend some little wealth for him. Wealth flows to a person who has renounced it. This fact is proved in Sri Ramakrishna's divine life. You know, when Lakshmi was born or she got manifested because the God, deities, there is no birth for them. And Lakshmi got manifested during the Samudra Manthana, the churning of the ocean with the divine snake and the mount as the churning rod, the ocean was churned where the two parties who were churning, the one side was the demons, the other side was the gods. And so many things came up. The divine horse, the divine elephant, the divine jewels, so many things, poison, then even Amruta in the final, but in between, Mother Lakshmi also got manifested at that time. So all the demons, all the gods, they wanted Lakshmi and all the other things, beautiful things there. <clears throat> but only two people who were not attracted or bothered towards <clears throat> that Lakshmi was Shiva, Parameshwara and Vishnu, Paramatma. It is Narayana, Shiva and Vishnu. And not at all bothered about Lakshmi coming there. But all the other, the demons, the devatas, the small letter gods, Indra, Chandra, Vayavarana, they all wanted Lakshmi for themselves. So whoever wanted them, Lakshmi didn't like them. She didn't want to go there. But she saw these two people, Shiva and Vishnu, they're not even caring or bothering about Lakshmi. But these two are the suitable people. She liked Shiva. She went. She wanted to marry Shiva. Because he was not at all bothered. He was in his own highest state. Then Lakshmi thought, Shiva has little anger to get angry. So then she went to Vishnu. Vishnu, calm, quiet. Not at all bothering about Lakshmi. She became his wife or the slave. Sitting at the feet of Vishnu, she serves him. So who didn't want Lakshmi, who didn't want wealth, she is attracted. So what is the point here in this? If you are asked after Lakshmi wealth, she will not come to you. People who give up, they don't want she will come and fall at her feet. Wealth will come automatically. But we go on seeking, seeking and we don't get it at all. So now you can see in the life of Sri Ramakrishna, wealth flows to that person who has renounced it. This fact is proved in Sri Ramakrishna's divine life. Saving for the future is essential for a person who lives in the world as no one knows what need may unexpectedly arise. But Sri Ramakrishna could not save anything even for the next moment because he was non-attached. He was only attached to God. Nothing but God. Other people used to procure things for him. We had read in the Bhagavad Gita, person, people who meditate on me, Krishna tells, people who meditate on God without any other thought to them, thus ever zealously engaged, I carry what they lack and preserve what they already have. Yoga Kshemam Vahamiham, ninth chapter, 22nd verse. Lord Krishna, as the divine Parabrahman, Paramatman promises persons who meditate on me, Ananyas Chintayanto Maam, Yejana Haparyupasate, Tesham Nitya Vyuktanam, Yoga Kshemam Vahamiham. People who meditate on me without any other thought for their own selfishness to them, thus ever zealously engaged, I carry what they lack and preserve what they already have. I will take care of them, both spiritual and worldly needs. Everything I will take care of him. So, but at that time, we could not understand the true significance of this statement. 
Shishimaraj is telling later Sri Ramakrishna's divine life made it quite clear to us. So now we have read from Ramakrishna Nandaji's view of Sri Ramakrishna. We got that newly. So I shared with that. I will continue that in the next class. Now we shall go for some incidents which happened in the life of Ramakrishna Nandaji because I'm getting newer things, so many other things. I will share all those things. So Swami Ramakrishna Nandaji then called Shishi Bhushan Chakravarti, Shishi Maharaj. As youths, they started coming to Ramakrishna. So through that, they came in contact with Naren. No, Narendra, that is Swami Vivekananda. And Sharada Nanda, his premier monastic name was Sharachandra Chakravarti. He was a, the cousin very closely related to Shishi. Now, Shishi, that is Shishi Maharaj, our would be Ramakrishna and the Naren, the would be Swami Vivekananda, Sharat, the would be Swami Sharadananda. They were inseparable. They had become so close friends after they came into contact with Ramakrishna through Ramakrishna. Now, earlier, they may be now Sharat and Shishi may be relatives. Narendra might have been not known to him, but once they came in contact with through Ramakrishna, they became so inseparable because now they are connect, connected through God or spirit. They spent long days together at the temple that is Dakshineshwar, Bhotarani temple and their discussions and conferences were unending. Shashi told me of one night when those three friends, Shishi, Naren and Sharat, Swami Ramakrishnananda, Swami Vivekananda and Swami Sharadananda later on. So Shashi, Naren and Sharat, in their youthful days when they came in contact with Ramakrishna. So now Shashi told me of one night when the three walked back from Dakshineshwar together, reaching Calcutta, which is six or seven miles, reaching Calcutta, they could not bear to separate. So Narendra went home with Sharat and Shashi. The two cousins lived under the same roof. Then Sharat and Shashi walked to Narendra's house. Still, the discussions was not finished. So Narendra came back to Shashi and Sharat again. And Sharat and Shashi returned with Naren again to his house, discussing about God. This kept up till two o'clock in the morning. So it is deep, dead night now. Then none of the boys dared go home because now if you go back to your home, two o'clock, what will the parents now do? They will scold them. How will they open the door? While they were debating what to do, an old house collapsed in the neighborhood. They ran to the rescue of the occupants and in the excitement, no one noticed their return. Beyond a few incidences of this time, there are so many other things of their friendship when they started getting connected through the spirit, through God, to Ramakrishna. So this is one of the incidences I got. I'll be sharing so many other incidences later on. Now we will come to the writings, the complete works of Shishi Maharaj or Swami Ramakrishna Anandaji. So now yesterday we had taken up the teaching, the writings of Swami Ramakrishna Anandaji. When he came to Madras, he started giving a series of lectures, all that have been recorded. 
we had read some of the excerpts from some of the teachings of Swami Ramakrishna and the Ji of his lecture. We will continue where we had left yesterday. So in, in one of his lectures, Swami Ramakrishna and the Ji is telling about the Vedanta, about the Upanishads. In this big life between birth and death, the senses arise and set. In this big life, our life, what is our life? The life is the gap between birth and our birth and death. That is life. So in this big gap or in this big life, what we call life between birth and death, our senses rise and set. The mind rises and sets. Your body rises and sets. But you never rise or set. The witness, the pure witness who is witnessing all these things, the eye consciousness, the pure consciousness, who is behind all these things, watching all these things, the Sakshi, the eternal witness. But you, so here that is I, the eye consciousness, the true self, not the ego. But you never rise. Your ego also rises and sets. Your body, your mind, everything in this life, your senses, they rise and set. But you, your true nature, never rises or sets. In an unbroken, steady flow, you are flowing on from your birth to your death. Thus, you see that behind all things changing, all things transmigratory or fleeting, thus you see that behind all the things changing, don't you see there is something which does not change, which is constant? And as the laws of the nature are uniform throughout, you draw your own conclusions from this. Just as when you taste one mango or whichever fruit you like, you conclude that all mangoes are, will have the same taste. You analyze your own body and mind and you find that both are constantly changing, isn't it? Every second, your mind, your body, your every cells, your hair, your thoughts, your ego, everything is constantly changing. You start analyzing your own body, mind, and you find both are constant, all are constantly changing. Time, that is, was when this body could not go from one place to another. That when you are crawling, when you are just born baby, when you are walking on your foe, <clears throat> time was when this body could not go from one place to another. It had to have a nurse to carry it. Then after you started toddling, then this body began to run and jump. Then you take gymnastics, gymnastic exercises. You can gallop and now gradually it is beginning to wane. You are becoming old. You are losing power. The power is being taken away from the eyes, from the ears. You have to go to the audiologist, test your ears. Then you have to go to the eye specialist to test your eyes. The power of the eyes is waning. So you get a glass. Still it cannot see properly. The power of the ears are going the power is being taken away from the eyes, from the ears, from the nose, from the legs, <clears throat> from the waist. You can't stand up, you can't sit down. And also the power is taken away from the mind. So you find the body is in constant change and the mind constantly restless. Hence, you pronounce that the nature of the body is to change. And the nature of the mind is also to change. But go behind, go beyond. And you will find that you never change. 
you are that same constant go beyond your ego go beyond your body go beyond your mind go beyond your thoughts go beyond your ego and you see it doesn't change go behind go beyond and you will find that you never change now swami ramakrishna anandaji ji arshashi maharaj is asking now what is meant by change now he gives so many day to day examples what is meant by change if the government changes it means the going out of one party and the coming in of another party then what do you mean by climate change in the climatic changes it means that it was cold now see it was winter here in south africa and it is gradually going away june july was maximum winter august there is some cold so now it will go to spring and in northern hemisphere in india it is now rainy season so from that rainy season it is going to the sharat kala next so in the climatic changes it means that it was cold and it has become hot or the rivers so change they pour means the birth of one and the death of another substitute the words birth and death for change and you can say since i am changeless that witness eternal witness which is watching all this change of weather change of mind change of body change of ego that is not at all changing since i am changeless i must be birthless since i am changeless the true i my true nature pure consciousness is birthless it must be also deathless so i must be eternal hence i am not only blissful but also eternal by nature so now how nicely intellectually ramakrishna anand ji is convincing us through common example that we are eternal we are deathless we are birthless see these are all the qualities of our true nature of your consciousness our real nature is this and we are reading we were reading all these things in the mandukya upanishad and all the other upanishads too recently we were undergoing that study of mandukya upanishad so all the same thing now so simply so nicely ramakrishna anand ji is explaining all the stars knowledge since i am changeless i must be birthless and deathless so if i am birthless and deathless then i am pure joy so i must be eternal existing always hence i am not only blissful because i don't have death i don't have birth i am always blissful there is no change hence i am not only blissful but also eternal by nature now you come to the another aspect the first aspect was changeless your true nature then blissful eternal by nature then he takes up existence that i am existing of this i cannot entertain any doubt do you have any doubt whether you are existing or not because until otherwise you couldn't have heard what i am telling you could have not been there you could have not been thinking so that i am existing of this i cannot entertain any doubt you are existing you can see so many people are watching this they are also existing her neighbors they are all existing that i am existing of this i cannot entertain any doubt suppose you start doubting your existence or the existence of others suppose i doubt it to do this a doubter is necessary to doubt your existence or anybody else's existence or god exists god's existence to do the doubting you need the doubter to exist 
Suppose I doubt it, to do this, a doubter is necessary. And if I doubt the existence of this doubter, then still another doubter must be here. And if I doubt this one, there must be another. So the doubter must be, must have to be there. So the doubter must have to exist. It must continue to exist. Now, doubting and thinking are synonymous. Because thinking is general, doubting is particular. So doubting and thinking are synonymous. You think so long as you doubt. For instance, you see a rope. You, I think all of you have seen a rope. For instance, you see a rope and you take it for a snake. <clears throat> Sometimes on the road, in the darkness, semi-darkness or semi-shade, it will be the rope will be lying like this zigzag. And you will mistake it for a snake. You take it for a snake. Then you think, oh, it may be a rope after all. But the wind moves it, and again you think it might be it may be a snake. And at last you see positively that it is not a snake, it is a rope, and now you are satisfied. So long as there was any doubt in your mind, you kept on th thinking, isn't it? Until it was moving. So long as there was any doubt in your mind, you kept thinking. The moment you cease to doubt, you stop thinking about that. Hence, now Ramakrishnananda Ji is giving the example or the teaching of des Descrates. Hence, Descrates has said, Cogito ergo sum. Cogito ergo sum. Descrates has said, Cogito ergo sum. If I doubt my own existence, I must think, and if I think, I must exist. So how can you doubt your existence? Since furthermore, being can never come out of non-being. A living being cannot come out of a non-being non from zero. If I am being, I must be eternal. Whoever is born of woman, must have to die. But I have just found out that I cannot die. We saw that we are all eternal. Now through the intellectually intellectual study, Ramakrishna and the convinced that we are eternal. We cannot die. We cannot we are not born. But the body, the mind and other things, whoever is born of a woman, that body have to die. But I have just found that Find out, found out that I cannot die, I am eternal. Then if I am eternal, I cannot be the body. Who am I? Who am I then? Who am I then? I must be merely a dweller inside the body. I must be merely a dweller inside the body. That's called Purusha. Pureshete iti Purushaha. Purusha and Prakriti in the yoga, you call that separate the Purusha and Prakriti. That is the goal of Raja Yoga. So what is this Purusha? Purusha means do you think it's man? No. Having a mustache or the beard or the other outer insignia of a man. Is he a man? Purusha means no. And what is Purusha? Pureshethi iti Purusha. The indweller in this town called this body. The person who lives in this town or city, Pure, Pura means city, town, Shete, who lives. That is Purusha. So who am I then? I must be merely a dweller inside the body. And the time that I dwell here is what we call life. So see, we have understood life in a different perspective now. The gap, the time gap between birth and life, we saw it was life. Birth and death, that was life. So now here, another description. And what is that? Who am I? I must be merely a dweller inside this body. And the time I dwell here in this body is what is called life. But 
if i am different from the body then i cannot have the same nature as the body isn't it if i am changing if i am the body if i am different from the body i cannot have the same nature as the body if i am eternal and the body is perishable the body and i must be diametrically opposite in nature i am eternal and the body is perishable the body and i must be diametrically opposite in nature and what is true of the body and what is true of the body that is the destructive nature cannot be true of me because i am eternal what is born of the body can never be born of me so if desires are born of the body they cannot be born of me that doesn't belong to me the desires and all the other things the pain the miseries then i must be wantless so i must be the richest man in the whole world because i am wantless i am not the body what is born of body can never be born of me so if desires are born of the body then they cannot be born of me then i must be wantless so i must be the richest man in the whole world for even an emperor is not free from wants now ramakrishna and the ji is telling go to indra the god of small letter the king of small letter gods indra chandra vayu varuna all those things so many gods are there all the navagrahas ashtavasu so he is a king of those gods indra go to indra himself and you will find that he has so many desires so he is poor if he, even if he is the king of the heaven is still poor because he has desires everyone has wants but the real i who lives in the body the indwella not the body not the mind not the ego the true i but i have no want whatever so i must be the richest man if i am without want or lack of any kind i must be perfect so perfection needs no addiction when you are perfect you don't need any addiction why do people go to alcohol smoking and drug addiction because they think they are imperfect but in reality perfection you are perfect perfection needs no addiction so being perfect nothing can be added to me i am all full purnamadah purnamidam purnat purnam udachyate purnasya purnam adaya purnam eva avashishyate i am all full nothing can be added to me i am all full and if i am wantless i must be unlimited if i am all full then i am infinite i must be unlimited and hence i must be infinite and if i am infinite i must be infinitely conscious and if i am infinitely conscious i must be all knowing sarvagna i know everything past present future everything and since knowledge is power since knowledge is power i am all knowing i am all powerful so i am all powerful but all these conditions are true of me only who am only indweller inside the body not the body so when you identify with the body all this goes away when you identify with your true nature you will get back all these things but all these conditions are true of me who am only indweller the pure consciousness inside the body they must be all inside and not outside in the world so he has freed himself from slavery he had freed he had he has freed himself from slavery who knows that all things that he wants are to be found inside himself and not outside 
that's why there is no need of dependence either mentally psychologically or physically or anybody or anything outside because you are full he has freed himself from the slavery who knows that all things that he wants are to be found inside himself and not outside for then all want ceases and want eats into man desire eats into man or woman not only in this life the desire and wants eats us not only in this life but all lives to come if then everything you want is inside is it not foolish to keep all things that interest you outside yourself your friends your pleasures your pursuits your wealth your vehicles your house all outside yourself when you don't have want you are full so long as you do this you will never get rid of your miseries if then everything you want is inside is it not foolish to keep all things that interest you outside yourself your friends your pleasures your pursuits all outside yourself so long as you do this so long as you do this try to search for happiness and wants outside so long as you do this you will never get rid of your miseries you will never get rid of your miseries this world is nothing but a glided sepul tree this world is nothing but a glided sepul tree this is what called as philosophy or gnana this is gnana marga this is the method or the path of sankhya or gnana this is what is called philosophy after analyzing this is the way we have to analyze our own true nature after analyzing vichara through viveka discrimination through the knowledge the wisdom this is what is called philosophy after analyzing the great sages found out all this that the great rishis the sages found out all this so they betook themselves to mountains to caves or into the heart of the jungles and by going inside they discovered the fundamental truths of the universe knowing one by which we can know everything so they discovered the fundamental truths of the universe and that is education from this analysis of their own nature the vedas have come into existence so how did the vedas come into existence from this analysis of their own true nature the vedas have come into existence from such discoveries in the spiritual realm we have got all our scriptures but leave that aside just now coming back to our original subject if i ask who are you if i ask ramakrishna and the ji is asking all of you who are you you will reply i am mrs or mr so and so son of mr or mrs so and so i am by birth a brahmin a vaishnava or a smarta or a shakta i am tall i am short i am fair i am dark etc and you are thinking if i do not get food starvation will kill me if i do not get water thirst will kill me if i do not get air suffocation will overpower me now to jump suddenly from this habit of thought to that other pole that you are infinite is not possible in a single moment so long as you love these men whom you call your friends your neighbors your wife your husband your father your brother and these ladies and men whom you call mother sister wife daughter you will have no consciousness of other aspect of your nature 
and you will think it is mere idle speculation of philosophy. You will say, I'm feeling hungry at this moment. How can you say that I have no hunger? I'm just now suffering from a bad headache or toothache. How can you say that I am not the body? But can you convince me that you are three and a half cubit in length? But can you convince me that you are three and a half cubit in length? Then I will come to your side. Intellectually, it is easy to grasp this idea that you are infinite. But when it comes to practice, it is very, very difficult for you to think that you must earn your living and that you must earn this man to get a position or that one for some other favor because you cannot jump from one pole to the other all at once. There must be gradations. So we are not moving from untruth to truth. We are moving, not moving from ignorance to knowledge, but we are moving from lower knowledge to higher knowledge. There must be gradations. Now, Ramakrishna Nandaji is giving a wonderful example. This example was given by Ramakrishna himself in the case of a de-addiction, how to de-addict people who are addicted to the drugs and alcohol. How should you de-addict? Ramakrishna gives this example in his life. Now the same example is taken up by Shashi Maharaj here. There was once an opium eater who went to a doctor to be cured of his habit. The doctor told, my dear fellow, the doctor said, you have been in the habit of taking such a large quantity of opium every day. It will not be possible for you to give it up all at once. But do this. Weigh the quantity you take each day with a piece of chalk. You know, you write on the board, the white chalk, chalk piece on the blackboard. You write it, isn't it? So you take each day with a piece of chalk. Do, weigh the quantity of opium you take each day with a piece of chalk on the other scale, but before you put the chunk on the scale, always draw a mark every day on the board or floor, wherever. So the patient did this and at the end of six months, he found out that the piece of the chunk, because he was writing every day, the date in the chunk, one mark each time he took it. So he found that the piece of chunk had been reduced to half its original size because he is marking it every day. And the size, of course, also the quantity of the opium taken had reduced to half. At the end of the year, there was no chalk left and he had completely broken himself from the addiction or the habit. So gradually, everything can be done. So gradually, everything can be done. Where there is a will, there is a way. If you want to do anything all at once, you will not succeed. Suppose a man has been in the habit of telling 100 lies a day. That teacher who says to him, telling lies is very bad. You must not tell any more. Will not be of any use to him. But the teacher who will say, you are in the habit of telling 100 lies a day. Very well. Begin by telling only 99. Then reduce it to 98. And so little by little, you will overcome the bad habit. He alone will be able to help him. This is the way all great teachers do. When a drunkard who used to come to our great master Sri Ramakrishna would ask him, that was Girish Chandra Ghosh, should I give up drinking the habit of alcohol? Ramakrishna replied, no. Why should you give up your drinking? Go on, just the same. But before you drink, offer the wine to God. Divine Mother Kali Ishta Devata, then this man would go away thinking, here is a man who holds out a hope to me and yet does not ask me to give up drinking alcohol. So he goes on, but he offers up what he takes to his Ishta Devata, God. And this thought of God gradually drives away all impurities. 
and he cares less and less to drinking. For this reason, Sri Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, even if a man of unholy life is devoted to me, you must regard him as a sadhu. Sadhu reva samantavyam. Samyak vyavasito hi saha. The Bhagavad Gita. Apichet sudurachāro bhajate maam ananya bhaak. Sadhu reva samantavyam. Samyak vyavasito hi saha. Lord Krishna tells, even if a man of unholy life. Apichet sudurachāro. Durachāri means the worst of the person of bad conduct. Sudurachāri means rank. Even if a man of unholy life is devoted to me, you must regard him as a sadhu because soon he will change. But now you may object. He is a wicked man. The worst of the wicked man. How can I regard such a man as a sadhu? A saint? Because Sri Krishna says he has formed a good resolve to worship me, to think of me. He has formed a good resolve so quickly that he becomes a righteous and attaineth to peace. He who is devoted to me is sure never to be undone. Durgatim Tatagachati, the person who has surrendered to me, devoted to me, will never get destroyed. So when Master Sri Ramakrishna asked these men to offer what they drank, to God, they began to acquire the habit of offering other things also to God. Then they began to inquire about this God to whom they were offering and thus their mind was turned more and more towards God and less and less towards sensual pleasures. In this way, Sri Ramakrishna cured many drunkards and their bad habits. This is always the way, this is always the way that a true teacher proceeds. No one will say to a baby, the just born baby, no one will say to the baby, you will have to walk four miles for your food. It is equally beyond the strength of an ordinary man to become perfect all at once. So the duty of a true teacher, the guru therefore is not to resist nature, but to give nature its course and gradually turn it. If you wish to stop a train, you must do it gradually, otherwise you will overturn the cars and kill many people. Stopping by degree is, a, is successful as well, natural. So it should be evolution, you have to evolve. It should not be revolution, it should be evolution, you have to evolve. That is what yesterday in the wellness talk, Mother Ushavasarama told, evolve. So it's not revolution, it's evolution. Stopping by degrees is successful as well as natural. So great teachers, guru, never ask a man to become perfect at once. And in this respect, our scriptures are wisest. Swami Vivekananda taught in the West that other religions give one coat for all, one hat for all, one pant, one size pant for all. But it is not possible for one coat to fit all men. And in the same way, one religion cannot suit all people. So Christ taught, if a man strikes you on one cheek, turn him to the other. This is all very nice, but who can follow it? Only a Christ can follow it. So although he was an avatar purusha, he was not a good a teacher. He taught that you must not cast pearls before swine. He taught that you must not cast pearls before swine, but he himself actually did it. A true teacher always goes down to the level of the taught. A true teacher, guru, always goes down to the level of the taught. We'll stop our discussion here. The wonderful teaching. I'm so thrilled, so nicely, the philosophy, the difficult terse things of the Upanishad has been explained by Ramakrishna Nandaji in his lecture so easily, made easy. Effortlessly we can understand it. So we'll continue this tomorrow also with some of the life incidences. 
with some of the sayings of Ramakrishna and the John Ramakrishna and also all these wonderful Upanishad teachings. So we will study the complete works of Ram, Swami Ramakrishna and the Ji. Take up that tomorrow. We will stop our discussions here. Now we will dedicate some time for question and answer if you have any. Any doubts, any question? Om Swamiji. Om, please tell Sri Kant. Maharaj, there's uh, two aspects that you have started with and end with. One is the when the Lord chastises or pushes us or um, urges us forward, like in Bhaja Govindam or how you had told us we have to awaken and um, you know put in the self effort, self effort. At the same time, the Lord is merciful to the extent that He'll say, even if you can't meditate, look at the picture of the Master, and even if you can't do that, bow down once in the morning and even these two aspects exist at the same time, Swamiji. My question is that is as follows. Um, what is um, more beneficial for us that we take this the chastisement and moving forward and running faster or existing like that bird that just sits on the mast and moves forward? A harmonious combination of both. Do everything and do nothing. Yeah, always Ramakrishna prescribed the combination, the harmonious combination of all four yogas. So he always was for harmony. So take up the aspect of self-surrender of the bird to the extent you can make it possible. And also putting in the self-effort to the extent it is possible. So it's a gradual process. If you have 50 steps, the baby has the 50 steps to climb, you cannot, the baby cannot climb the 50th step suddenly. So now the baby has to focus, how shall I climb the next step? So let us understand where we stand now and progress forward, combining, taking the help of all the teachings and putting it into practice, that's all. So let us live in the present. At present, at, at hand, what I have to do, let me do it. That will be the best help to, for me to build my future. Yeah, now there is one question. Jaima Pranam Swamiji. So the will has to come to the person addicted to not to the wish of the family members. How to motivate the person who is not willing? Now, if I come to know that I have a disease, then only I will go to the doctor. If I, if I think that I'm healthy, even though I have the disease, then how can you convince him to take the medicine or get the cure? So first of all, I should be made to know that I have the disease or I, I'm an addict. Just like a mad guy, he will take, he will go to the doctor and take the medicine only when he comes to know that he is mad. Ask a madman, he will all tell, no, I am not mad, I am fully normal. He will never tell that I am mad. The moment I come to know that I have the problem, any problem for that sake, mental, spiritual or physical, the moment I come to know I have a problem, then 50% of the problem is solved, convince him, convince that person. If you come to know that I have the disease, half the problem is solved, now I will go to take the medicine. If I am not at all convinced that I have a disease, I am normal, I am healthy, then why will I go to the doctor? I will never. So, addiction to opium or alcohol, anything, the moment you come to know that is bad, use both the the family members also have to convince him, support him, and also he should also use his will. Both, both is very, very necessary. The well-wishers, his will, the combined effort will help a lot. 
So, are there any more questions? Om Swamiji. <laughs> yes, Colin. So, please. From, from all the lessons that we've been listening to, few things are very, uh, very apparent. I'm, I'm saying this tongue in cheek, Swamiji. It seems like with all the austerities that all our direct disciples and even our master went through, um, they all very short-lived. From most of them uh, expired before uh, before they were fifty. Um, seems like it's a very dangerous profession, this for me. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> that's the one thing that I've done. But also, we I believe that one thing that at least the crow has taught us a lesson. I didn't know what was the um, purpose of having a crow around in this universe. But now that I know that at least a crow has got a lesson to teach us, and uh, the master has so succinctly put it across. And thank you for that, Swamiji. Yeah. As Swam Vivekananda tells, they alone live who live for others. The rest are dead, more dead than alive. These people who lived for others, short, though short, but they lived for others. So they are continuing to live even eternally. But we live only for the selfish thing. We are not even remembered by our own children. The moment we are dead, we are gone. Nobody will remember us. But see, these people short-lived, but we are remembering them and uh, hearing their teachings and reading them, analyzing them after 150 years too, maybe after 1,000 and 1,500 years too, we will be sitting and doing this. Yes, sir. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, so, if there are no questions and doubts, we can conclude with the prayer. Om Priyatam Pundari Kaksha Sarva Yagneshwaro Harihi Tasmin Tushte Jagat Tushtam Prinite Prinitam Jagat Harihi Om Tatsat Sri Ramakrishna Panamastu. Today also at 10 o'clock, the venue is the coffee shop Mug and Bean in Johannesburg. The same continuation of the wellness and health and other talk, the workshop by Dr. Usha Vastarema will continue. It was really beautiful yesterday. So people who are interested, want to get the benefit of wellness and health and mental and spiritual and emotional health. So wonderful, everything is being analyzed and the problems are solved in such a wonderful way, in a scientific way. All are welcome. So you can also bring your friends, tell your friends, tell people who are interested and bring them there. All are welcome. Make use of this opportunity. Thank you. Namaste. Om Namo Narayanaya.